Kabbalah is one of the most widely practiced forms of mysticism. Followers believe that decoding its ancient texts will reveal the answers to the greatest mysteries of life. In the 21st century, celebrities including Madonna and Britney Spears have taken up a modern interpretation of the practice. Yet the spread of Kabbalah has sparked controversy. Strict adherents warn that this mystical practice holds hidden perils. Throughout history, followers have coded their writings to protect Kabbalah's secrets. How many levels of understanding are there? Maybe infinite. So the more you have to decode the past, to decode the text, the more mystical it is, the harder it is to decode. In Babylon, at the beginning of the 6th century BCE, a young Israelite named Ezekiel has a vision. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, there was a throne. Sitting on the throne was a figure that looked like a man. Ezekiel believes he has peered into heaven and seen God seated on his throne. This vision captivates a group of Jewish mystics. They hope that by studying this image, they will one day see God for themselves and become one with the divine spirit. Jews who are seeking a mystical experience will try to reimagine what Ezekiel experienced. So it becomes the model for Jewish mystical ascent, really until the emergence of Kabbalah. In the second century CE, the Roman Empire controls what is now Israel. Jews who practice their faith openly are either killed or forced into exile. It is during this time that many Jews turn to mysticism to help them understand God's will. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is one of the men searching for answers. Rabbi Shimon uh, was a great advocate of the people of Israel and taught that uh, Israel has a special intimacy with God. And he fled from the Romans who sought to execute him because of anti-Roman statements he had made. According to Jewish texts, Bar Yochai hides from the Romans for 13 years in this cave in Pekayin, Israel. Here, Bar Yochai meditates on God and the universe using the Torah or Hebrew scriptures as his guide. His unique methods and devout practice make him one of the first key figures in Kabbalah's history. Like Bar Yochai, other small groups of Jewish mystics begin trying to achieve a greater understanding of God. Since God wasn't coming to them, they were going to where, to where God was. So they wanted some kind of experience of the divine. They used certain meditative techniques that worked them up into an auto-suggestive hypnotic trance. Their activities are kept hidden. The mystics warn that this practice is too dangerous for average people to attempt. Ancient legends tell of novices being driven mad or even dying because they were unprepared for the powerful spiritual forces they had unleashed. If you're not pure enough, if you're not modest enough, then God might not accept you, then God might not let you go through that journey. Through meditation, the mystics believe they have achieved a vision of God like the one experienced by the prophet Ezekiel. In this vision, the entrance to heaven is blocked by a series of gates. The mystics must pass through them before reaching God. The entrances are also guarded by menacing angels who keep the unworthy from heaven. Before the mystics can advance, they have to learn the complicated names of the angels. Each name must then be repeated an exact number of times. The mystics would wear amulets that would shield them from the power of the angels. And if they went through all the gates and they got into the throne room, then they would have this vision. They would learn the secrets 
the mystics claim those secrets help them understand God's thoughts. At roughly the same time, unknown mystics recorded a startling concept into an influential book. The text is called the Book of Creation, or the Sefer Yetzirah. It describes how God made the world by using the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. God spoke and said, let there be light. So obviously God's speech was the creating agent. Well, what language did God speak? God spoke Hebrew, of course. So the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet were the alphabet of creation. What Sefer Yitzhirah does is to try to describe how God created the world in more detail than we find in Genesis. It builds on the notion that God created the world through language, but now it's not words so much as individual letters. And this is probably meant rather literally. God took the three letters Aleph, Bet, Nun, which spelled the word Evan, stone. By combining those letters, a stone was created. And similarly with every object in the universe, God created by combining the letters with the numbers. Rabbis believe the teaching of the Sefer Yetzirah are too powerful for ordinary people to experience, and the details of the book are kept hidden. These mystical revelations remain underground for hundreds of years. In the 11th century, the Crusades begin a new wave of anti-Jewish persecution as Christian armies try to reclaim the Holy Land from the Arabs. Fleeing from torture and execution, Jews scatter across Europe and the Middle East, taking their secret traditions into new territories. By the 13th century, the mystical teachings have spread to Jewish communities in what are now Germany, France, and Spain. The term Kabbalah, meaning receiving in Hebrew, now becomes widely used to describe the practice. We're really talking about a small group of, of Jewish teachers, rabbis, spiritual people who were gathering the earlier traditions, developing techniques of meditation, and reimagining God in some very startling ways. One of the most significant events in Kabbalah's history occurs around 1280, when a Spanish rabbi claims to discover yet another mysterious text. This will soon become the single most important book in Kabbalah. It is called the Zohar, meaning radiance or splendor in Hebrew. It's really the masterpiece of Kabbalah. The ideas of the Zohar are very radical and very startling. Written mainly in Aramaic, its pages are filled with arcane symbolism and erotic language. By arousal below, there is similarly arousal above. Male and female unite, desire prevails. Worlds are blessed, and above and below are in joy. To this day, the author of the Zohar remains a mystery. Many Kabbalists believe that Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai received divine inspiration to write the Zohar while living in a cave during the second century. Others suspect that the manuscript was written a thousand years later, possibly by a Spanish Kabbalist or even by a group of rabbis. It's in a way written by someone in Aramaic who didn't really know Aramaic that well. And you also strangely find words in medieval Portuguese and Spanish in the Zohar. So the question scholars have been wrestling with for a couple of hundred years now is who wrote it? and how did it come to be? But the greatest mystery of the Zohar lies within its mystical text. You have to work so hard to decipher it, and this is why it's so attractive, because of this beautiful game it plays with you uh, of revealing and hiding. Decoding these complicated passages promises a greater understanding of God and his relationship with humans. 
The Zohar really sees the Bible as a secret code. Every event in the Zohar, every bit of narrative, every biblical law, is telling something not only about what happens on Earth, but about God's inner being. Kabbalists believe that if they can successfully decode the Zohar, they will unlock the mysteries of both heaven and earth. One of these secrets is a startling revelation about God's body and sexuality. By the 13th century, Kabbalah had spread throughout Europe and the Middle East. Yet even as the number of Jews studying Kabbalah grew, their secrets remained closely guarded. Ever since, scholars have been searching for ways to unravel these secrets. In Berkeley, California, Daniel Matt works surrounded by these copies of the Zohar, the most revered and mysterious manuscript in Kabbalah. His bookcase is filled with versions and commentaries in Aramaic, Hebrew, English, and French. They come from libraries around the world. He hopes to complete the first English translation of the Zohar based on original Aramaic texts. This ambitious work is the latest attempt to understand a book that has perplexed scholars for over 700 years. I don't want to ruin the mystery or the, the strange cryptic quality of the Zohar, but I'm trying to make it accessible to a contemporary reader. The Zohar is perhaps the most difficult Jewish text to translate. Most of its roughly 2,000 pages are in Aramaic, an arcane language that may have been used to further complicate the decoding process. On the surface, the Zohar is a novel which follows Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and a group of rabbis on a journey through what is now Israel. They wander through the hills of Galilee, sharing their secret teachings, sometimes running into strange characters on the road. Kabbalists believe that the narrative holds clues that can explain hidden meanings in the Torah or Hebrew scriptures. Several examples can be found by re-examining the book of Genesis. Here, the Zohar overturns the traditional account that God expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. The Zohar's interpretation illustrates a revolutionary belief that humans can direct God. But the Zohar asks a very radical question. It says, who kicked whom out of the Garden? And the Zohar actually teaches Adam expelled God from the Garden. It's as if we're still in the Garden. But we don't realize it because we've, we've expelled God. We, we've lost touch with a spiritual dimension. And the challenge is to regain some awareness, some intimacy with the divine. The further Kabbalists delve into the Zohar, the more cryptic the words become. It has a very sim uh, rich symbolic system this is a deliberated means to uh, keep the Zohar for the elite only. The writers probably thought that only those who are spiritual enough will be able to decipher it. The major symbolic code found in the Zohar is the 10 aspects of God's personality, the 10 Sifirot. One popular interpretation shows these characteristics as a map of God's body. Kabbalists believe that if they can understand God's anatomy, they can learn how his powers work. These ancient drawings reveal that God's body is similar to humans. The top symbolizes God's head, which is the source of will, wisdom, and understanding. Below that are symmetrically arranged organs and limbs, representing love, power, beauty, eternity, and splendor. The most unusual part of the diagram contains sensual imagery. The ninth part of God, called the foundation, is the phallus, 
or procreative life force of the universe. But according to the Sifirot, God also has female components. The final element, often called Shekinah, was depicted as the feminine half of God. This image challenged the age-old view of a strictly masculine God. What we find for the first time is that this feminine aspect, the feminine consort of God, is divine and is part of the divinity. So to unite the male and female halves of God, this becomes the goal of the whole system of the Sefirot. And the Zohar describes that union in very graphic terms. There really is a romance within God and a, a sexual union. And that's a striking element of, of the Zohar probably led to its to its wide appeal in some ways. This complicated system supported the Kabbalist teaching that humans affect God. Students of the Zohar believe that human actions unite these masculine and feminine parts of God. How are the two halves of God united? Through human virtue, through loving one's neighbor, through helping the poor, through observing the Sabbath, through various interpersonal and ritual commandments, one brings together these two halves of God. You might say that this is how we actualize the divine potential in the world. The idea that God is dependent on human beings clashed with traditional beliefs that saw God as an omnipotent ruler. We, and this is, I think, an extraordinary idea of the Kabbalists, we have the ability, through the performance of sacred deeds, to nurture God, to influence God, to affect God, to be able to affect the divine disposition, which then will affect the flow down of divine grace to our world. But in this relationship, human sins create imbalance. In this case, human misdeeds, human unethical conduct, human evil empowers the cosmic evil or somehow ruins the harmony within God and stimulates evil in the universe. Another revolutionary idea encrypted in the Zohar is that even a seemingly insignificant verse in the Hebrew scriptures can reveal how God feels and acts. In the Zohar, they read the Bible not only as a story about human beings, what's going on in human affairs, but they also read it on a mystical level as a story about what's going on within the inner life of God. According to the Zohar, biblical characters are often metaphors for God's thoughts and actions. The quality of loving kindness, for instance, came to be associated with Abraham in the Bible. So every reference to Abraham doing something was actually viewed as a reference to the role of loving kindness in the world. The Zohar also examines biblical events for hidden meanings. The flood, according to Kabbalah, is happening now. If you don't know that the flood is still going on, then you're drowning and you don't even know it. So various symbols of chaos and destruction from the Bible were also viewed, not in the past tense, but as still unfolding. While mystics continued to explore the mysteries of the Zohar, another 13th century Spanish Kabbalist was devising a new method for uniting with God. Abraham Abu Lafia's technique involved intense meditation and yoga-like movements. His followers would use certain hand and head movements to concentrate on the Bible's Hebrew letters. The most ancient idea is that God has multiple names and these names have power. Abu Lafia wanted to have a reading of the Bible according to which the entire Bible speaks solely about God. 
by transforming the normal Hebrew nouns and verbs into divine names. One of the divine names Abu Lafia used was the 72-letter name taken from three verses in Exodus. When the letters in the verses were combined according to Abu Lafia's instructions, they spelled one of God's secret names. Through intense meditation on these letters, Abu Lafia believed the human mind and God's mind would then unite. Some Kabbalists claim that Moses meditated on this name in order to part the Red Sea. At the height of the Spanish Inquisition, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella declared that all Jews must either convert to Christianity or be expelled. During 1492, over 100,000 Jews fled Spain. Once again, religious persecution influenced the spread of Kabbalah's teachings. A century later, many Kabbalists would use their techniques to call forth the promised Messiah. In 1492, the Spanish Inquisition cast tens of thousands of Jews into exile. Many fled to the Holy Land. Ninety miles north of Jerusalem, in the Galilee region, Jewish mystics known as Kabbalists settled in the town of Safed. A number of Kabbalists were attracted to Galilee, partly because Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the hero of the Zohar, had wandered around the Galilee. Today, the dusty, winding roads of Safed are peopled by artists and lined with galleries. Five centuries ago, however, Kabbalists believed that the Messiah would one day walk these same streets. One of the scriptures, it is being said that the Messiah, when the Messiah will come to Jerusalem, he will first appear in the Galilee. So they sort of want to be the first ones to catch him. The mystical text known as the Zohar taught that good behavior increased God's powers on earth. Based on this philosophy, Kabbalists hoped that a life of holiness would bring forth the Messiah. Kabbalists in Safed strove to become a perfect religious society. The feeling was that uh, people have to help God bring the uh, Messiah. They have to be pure enough. They would be up at midnight to say the prayers and then up again at dawn to pray with the rising of the sun. Kabbalah masters in Safed instructed their followers to engage in meticulous meditation, fasts, and adherence to the Torah. The most famous leader was Rabbi Isaac Luria from Jerusalem. By the time Luria began teaching in Safed in 1570, he was regarded as one of the most important holy men of the century. As a young man, Luria had spent several years in seclusion near Cairo, Egypt. There, Kabbalists say, Luria studied the Zohar and had visions of angels and biblical prophets. There's some evidence that he used the Zohar as sort of a, a mantra, that he would take passages of the Zohar and repeat it over and over again until he got deep inside it. In this trance-like state, Luria acquired extraordinary abilities. Rabbi Isaac Luria, he could look at a person's forehead and read everything about, about that person. S somewhat like reading the, the palm. He was a healer. He could tell people's past lives and what has to, to be fixed. 
Luria believed that understanding a person's prior life would provide insight into their current problems. He taught a theory of reincarnation in which he claimed that every individual is descended from a certain soul root after Adam and Eve. You're descended from either Cain or Abel, or you're descended from the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japhet. So you have at least five options, if not more, of a basic soul root, and that soul root determines your essential nature. With Luria's help, many Kabbalists searched for links to their past. These burial sites around Safed took on an important role as Kabbalists tried to find the graves of their previous incarnations. They would take on the soul of the deceased who was lying there and speak with that person's voice. To this day, gravesite rituals and pilgrimages continue around Safed. Here, followers gather at the tomb of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Some are practicing Luria's teachings. One of Luria's main contributions to Kabbalah was a new concept of creation. The world only exists because God needed somebody to relate to, implying that God has some need for love, for relationship. Luria taught that the first act was not creation, but actually a withdrawal. God withdrew, you might say, in all directions from one central point, creating a kind of vacuum, an empty spot within God. According to Luria, the emptiness gave God room to create the world. God placed vessels in the void and began filling them with divine light, shattering several of the vessels. In this case, the creation of the world and catastrophe are tied together. You can't have creativity without destruction at the same time. Luria explained that sparks from the shattered vessels fell to earth. Everything God created contained one of these divine sparks. According to Luria, humans can reunite these fragments of divine spirit with God through good works. Our deeds can repair the upper world. And when all of those sparks are restored, then you have messianic redemption. In 1572, when Isaac Luria died of the plague, many Kabbalists feared his death was a punishment for revealing forbidden secrets. It's a blow to the expectations of redemption. After suffered sort of fades away gradually until the, the end of the century. The invention of the printing press would soon spread Kabbalah's teachings like never before. By the time of Luria's death, bound copies of the Zohar, as well as manuscripts written in Safed, were available to the public. Kabbalah seemed to have finally come out of hiding. By the 16th century, Kabbalah's mystical ideas had reached much of the Jewish world. Followers practiced throughout Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. In the coming century, Kabbalah would spread like religious wildfire, but in the wrong hands, its teachings would have disastrous repercussions. The 16th century was marked by the unprecedented spread of the Jewish mysticism known as Kabbalah. It began when the Zohar and other mystical works were translated into Latin, 
Christian philosophers were eager to study Kabbalah and believed it could help solve the mysteries of their own faith. They are very much interested in Kabbalah, especially as the Zohar is perceived as a text that was written more or less in that period of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Hence, they assume that there is an uncontaminated, pure Judaism of the time of Christ, which uh, entails the truths of Christianity. This belief was the foundation of what is often called Christian Kabbalah. Renaissance thinkers also use Kabbalah to understand the works of Pythagoras and Plato, whose philosophies mirrored aspects of Jewish mysticism. Some scholars claim philosopher Gottfried Leibniz, who invented calculus, and even Isaac Newton studied Kabbalistic ideas. I wouldn't assume that modern uh, science is based on, uh, on Kabbalah, but certainly the people who created modern science and modern philosophy, there was an interest in Kabbalah. Meanwhile, Kabbalah was also being studied by two men who would unknowingly spark one of the greatest catastrophes in Kabbalah's history. Shabbatai Zvi was born in what is now Izmir, Turkey in 1626. As a young man, Zvi suffered from recurring nightmares about demonic attacks and turned to the Zohar for answers. Shabbatai Tzvi was apparently a very gifted but very troubled young man who had reached a crisis by the age of 40. Scholars now believe Zvi experienced alternating states of deep depression and manic euphoria. The climax came when he staged a mock marriage between himself and a Torah scroll. It was the nature of his affliction to periodically violate the commandments publicly and be thrown out of a community on a wave of scandal. Banished by several Jewish communities in the Ottoman Empire, Zvi fled to Jerusalem, where he wandered through the streets reciting Kabbalistic chants. In 1665, Zvi met Nathan of Gaza, a young man studying Kabbalah. The two spent several weeks together traveling through what is now Israel. In time, Nathan became convinced that Zvi was the Messiah. Nathan proclaimed that the Messiah had appeared. The good news traveled from synagogue to synagogue in the Ottoman Empire and then in Europe. By 1666, the entire Jewish world was captivated by the coming of the Messiah. Shantai Tzvi was a manic depressive, and, <laughs> but a very charismatic manic depressive. And, uh, and a lot of people gathered around him. But, uh, you know, other people felt that you know, the time was ripe. In fact, this might be what we've been waiting for. In early 1666, Ottoman soldiers arrested Zvi and brought him to the Sultan's palace in what is now Turkey. The Sultan sentenced Zvi to death for creating a public frenzy. The Turkish Sultan gave him a, an offer you can't refuse, namely convert to Islam or I'll cut your head off because if you are the Messiah and I cut your head off, you'll be able to put it back. Now, if Shabtat Tzvi had been willing to have been martyred, uh, this might have created another phenomenon such as Jesus. Here's the Messiah dying for his faith. But Shabtat Tzvi took the easy way out and converted to Islam. When Zvi emerged from the palace a Muslim, a handful of supporters followed his example and converted to Islam. But the vast majority of Jews were outraged. Jews accused Kabbalists of heresy and blamed Kabbalah for leading them astray. I would say that one of the major effects he had was convincing people that mysticism was bad stuff, that mysticism was dangerous, that mysticism led to all kinds of uh, terrible things. It's at that point that you have uh, the restrictions really put into place 
more more severely about who should study Kabbalah and how widely it, it could be spread. A few Kabbalistic circles continued to thrive in Eastern Europe, including a group whose practice became known as Hasidism. A rabbi and mystic called the Baal Shem Tov, or Master of the Good Name, became the leader of the Hasidic movement at the beginning of the 18th century. The Baal Shem Tov unified other mystical circles who were operating under the radar, as it were. While early Kabbalah had been reserved for a select few, Hasidism took elements of Kabbalah and made them accessible to ordinary people. Contrary to the strict meditation and study of early Kabbalah, Hasidism emphasized celebrating God in everyday life. Hasidism also encouraged a more open exchange of Kabbalistic ideas. There's a democratic impulse in Hasidism. Anyone can serve God, anyone is beloved of God, if one discovers the spark. So this idea of the hidden sparks, which had appeared in Kabbalah, now it becomes a technique of, of finding God in the world. While the larger Jewish population continued to shun mysticism, Hasidic Jews preserved Kabbalah's traditions throughout the 1800s. Today, Kabbalah has taken on an entirely new appearance in the City of Angels. Some scholars believe this trend is precisely what early practitioners had feared most, that Kabbalah would fall into the hands of the spiritually unprepared. Kabbalah achieved widespread popularity for the first time in the late 1600s. But when the mystical practice became linked to a false messiah, Kabbalists across Europe and the Middle East were shunned. For the next 250 years, Kabbalah remained in the shadows of Jewish life. In the 1930s, a German historian named Gershom Scholem began to rediscover the teachings of Jewish mysticism. He spent many, many years traveling through the libraries of Europe and cataloging and reading these manuscripts, some of which had simply not been opened for decades or, or in some cases, centuries. You could say that he made this material accessible to the Western world. As Hitler's Third Reich spread terror throughout Europe, Jews found themselves struggling to understand the persecution, torture, and murder faced by their people. Kabbalah's belief that evil deeds could throw the universe out of balance was tragically underscored by the Holocaust. With over six million Jews killed, the world had reached one of its darkest hours, Yet Jews and Kabbalists were also hopeful that the world could be repaired. At times of crisis, at times of suffering, when people are trying to satisfy their own need for order and meaning and fulfillment, mysticism can provide some of the answer to that. In the 1960s, the American counterculture explored new approaches to religion. One of those spiritual seekers was Philip Berg, a rabbi from New York. In the late 1960s, Berg traveled to Israel, where he delved into Kabbalah's teachings. Berg soon devoted himself to studying the ancient practice. His goal was to share Kabbalah with the masses. He reshapes it by presenting in it a way that someone who's not versed in, in Kabbalistic text and, and doesn't know much even about Judaism can understand these ideas and apply them for his way of life. Berg's simplified interpretation of Kabbalah spread quickly. At the beginning of the 1970s, Berg opened his first Kabbalah center in Tel Aviv. During the 1980s, 
Philip Berg and his family constructed a Kabbalah empire based here in Los Angeles. Today, what is known as the Kabbalah Center has several million followers and operates branches in nearly 100 cities, making it the largest Kabbalistic organization in the world. Here at the LA headquarters, Kabbalah has caught the attention of celebrities seeking a spiritual dimension to their lives. Berg's two sons help promote the concept that unlike the restricted Kabbalah of the past, this practice is open to all. We offer Kabbalah for everyone, without any barriers, race, sex, religion, anything. So we're very uh, excited about the opportunity of bringing this wisdom, which has been hidden, to, to the masses by making it accessible, understandable, and practical. By opening the doors to everyone, the Kabbalah Center has opened itself to harsh criticism. You have all of these Hollywood people um, jumping on the Kabbalah bandwagon, but many of them are not Jews, and they're not observing Jewish law. Whether they're studying the real Kabbalah, I doubt it. They tend to say, here's a sacred name, here's a sacred practice. That will bequeath to you some Kabbalistic power. The Kabbalah Center emphasizes ancient practices such as meditating on the 72 names of God and making pilgrimages to Kabbalist sites in Israel, like Madonna did in 2004. A pop star called Madonna adopting Kabbalah. I think this is, in a nutshell, this is postmodern cult spirituality for you. It's really a, a match made in heaven between Kabbalah Center and Madonna. Wearing religious objects is also popular, such as tying a red string around the wrist to ward off evil forces. The practical Kabbalah, the world of amulets as it is today, is an aspect that they can touch, that they can read, that they can feel, that's physical. And these are all things uh, for which theoretical Kabbalah doesn't touch them, doesn't reach them. New Kabbalah is study Kabbalah not in order to understand the universe, the secrets of the universe, but in order to find a practical way of make, making your life better. Decoding Kabbalah has been a complex mystical journey for thousands of years, and the quest to control its secrets continues to this day. I think there is a struggle of possession of Kabbalistic knowledge, who's in the possession of interpreting it and explaining its worth and significance to the modern world. Okay, you could have a thought and that could connect you to God. That, that's what Kabbalah is about. This true, serious, deep study of Kabbalah is going on and will continue. I'm sure that a lot of them who are not, the not sincere ones will, you know, simply drop out sooner or later. Many followers say that even with absolute dedication, it is impossible to discover all the hidden meanings within Kabbalah. But there's another whole level that the Kabbalists have. There's so many layers and levels of Kabbalah that it, you could take your whole life and you're still not going to finish learning the universe of Kabbalah. This ancient mystical wisdom will no doubt continue to reveal new mysteries to the modern world. People search for new techniques and means and paths to make their lives spiritual. So I think as long as there will be humanity, there will be mysticism. It's something very ancient and something very immediate and contemporary at the same time. And I think that's what makes Kabbalah so intriguing, is that it, it's both new and ancient. This questioning, why are we here in the world? This questioning about the nature of God. And Kabbalah does promote and try to answer those questions.
term Kabbalah, meaning receiving in Hebrew, now becomes widely used to describe the practice. We're really talking about a small group of, of Jewish teachers, rabbis, spiritual people who were gathering the earlier traditions, developing techniques of meditation, and reimagining God in some very startling ways. One of the most significant events in Kabbalah's history occurs around 1280, when a Spanish rabbi claims to discover yet another mysterious text. This will soon become the single most important book in Kabbalah. It is called the Zohar, meaning radiance or splendor in Hebrew. It's really the masterpiece of Kabbalah. The ideas of the Zohar are very radical and very startling. Written mainly in Aramaic, its pages are filled with arcane symbolism and erotic language. By arousal below, there is similarly arousal above. Male and female unite, desire prevails, worlds are blessed, and above and below are in joy. To this day, the author of the Zohar remains a mystery. Many Kabbalists believe that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai received divine inspiration to write the Zohar while living in a cave during the second century. Jews who are seeking a mystical experience will try to reimagine what Ezekiel experienced. So it becomes the model for Jewish mystical ascent, really until the emergence of Kabbalah. In the second century CE, the Roman Empire controls what is now Israel. Jews who practice their faith openly are either killed or forced into exile. It is during this time that many Jews turn to mysticism to help them understand God's will. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is one of the men searching for answers. Rabbi Shimon uh, was a great advocate of the people of Israel and taught that uh, Israel has a special intimacy with God. And he fled from the Romans who sought to execute him because of anti-Roman statements he had made. According to Jewish texts, Bar Yochai hides from the Romans for 13 years in this cave in Pekayin, Israel. Here, Bar Yochai meditates on God and the universe using the Torah, or Hebrew scriptures, as his guide. His unique methods and devout practice make him one of the first key figures in Kabbalah's history. Like Bar Yochai, other small groups of Jewish mystics begin trying to achieve a greater understanding of God. Since God wasn't coming to them, they were going to where to where God was. So they wanted some kind of experience of the divine. They used certain meditative techniques that worked them up into an auto-suggestive hypnotic trance. Their activities are kept hidden. The mystics warn that this practice is too dangerous for average people to attempt. Ancient legends tell of novices being driven mad or even dying because they were unprepared for the powerful spiritual forces they had unleashed. If you're not pure enough, if you're not modest enough, then God might not accept you, then God might not let you go through that journey. Through meditation, the mystics believe they have achieved a vision of God like the one experienced by the prophet Ezekiel. In this vision, the entrance to heaven is blocked by a series of gates. The mystics must pass through them before reaching God. The entrances are also guarded by menacing angels who keep the unworthy from heaven. Before the mystics can advance, they have to learn the complicated names of the angels. Each name must then be repeated an exact number of times. The mystics would wear amulets that would shield them from the power of the angels. And if they went through, all the gates, and they got into the throne room, then they would have this vision, they would learn the secrets. 
the mystics claim those secrets help them understand God's thoughts. At roughly the same time, unknown mystics recorded a startling concept into an influential book. The text is called the Book of Creation, or the Sefer Yetzirah. It describes how God made the world by using the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. God spoke and said, let there be light. So obviously God's speech was the creating agent. Well, what language did God speak? God spoke Hebrew, of course. So the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet were the alphabet of creation. What Sefer Yitzhirah does is to try to describe how God created the world in more detail than we find in Genesis. It builds on the notion that God created the world through language, but now it's not words so much as individual letters. And this is probably meant rather literally. God took the three letters Aleph, Bet, Nun, which spell the word Evan, stone. By combining those letters, a stone was created. And similarly with every object in the universe, God created by combining the letters with the numbers. Rabbis believe the teaching of the Sefer Yetzirah are too powerful for ordinary people to experience, and the details of the book are kept hidden. These mystical revelations remain underground for hundreds of years. In the 11th century, the Crusades begin a new wave of anti-Jewish persecution as Christian armies try to reclaim the Holy Land from the Arabs. Fleeing from torture and execution, Jews scatter across Europe and the Middle East, taking their secret traditions into new territories. By the 13th century, the mystical teachings have spread to Jewish communities in what are now Germany, France, and Spain. Kabbalah is one of the most widely practiced forms of mysticism. Followers believe that decoding its ancient texts will reveal the answers to the greatest mysteries of life. In the 21st century, celebrities including Madonna and Britney Spears have taken up a modern interpretation of the practice. Yet the spread of Kabbalah has sparked controversy. Strict adherents warn that this mystical practice holds hidden perils. Throughout history, followers have coded their writings to protect Kabbalah's secrets. How many levels of understanding are there? Maybe infinite. So the more you have to decode the past, to decode the text, the more mystical it is, the harder it is to decode. In Babylon, at the beginning of the 6th century BCE, a young Israelite named Ezekiel has a vision. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, there was a throne. Sitting on the throne was a figure that looked like a man. Ezekiel believes he has peered into heaven and seen God seated on his throne. This vision captivates a group of Jewish mystics. They hope that by studying this image, they will one day see God for themselves and become one with the divine spirit.